feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in the shrimp tank. But it's a- hey, everybody. Welcome to the Shrimp Tank down here in Boca Raton, Florida. The Shrimp Tank is all about getting to interview the top business owners in our local community, top CEOs and presidents of their company. Whoever's on Facebook, stop putting your audio on on our team. But in general, we have hit 101 episodes. Last week, you know, we had episode 100. We got the opportunity to have Scott Adams, who originally launched the FAU Adams Center for Entrepreneurship. And it was really neat to have Jan Bedner come on because he is a alumni of FAU. And it was really neat to see Jan who went through the FAU College of Business. He was also a recipient of, you know, the business plan competition at the Adams Center and went through FAU Check Runway. And now has been uh, a recipient of the Forbes 30 under 30 list for his company, Shipmonk. So it was really interesting to see, to see someone who had such a passion for creating entrepreneurship in our local community get to interview someone who's been through all this so definitely catch episode 100 if you haven't it's on all our shrimp tank feeds on shrimptankpodcast.com up on itunes as well as iHeartRadio. and this is your first time tuning in this show is ran in collaboration with the fau adam center for entrepreneurship i'm jason hill my co-host today is dr kevin cox he's the director at the adam center so kevin besides laughing at my haircut over here i know you know, we were joking around about haircuts and I have a big bald spot. You know, what's going on at FAU? Uh, you know, we're making our way through. We're evolving. We're adapting. And, um, you know, there's one thing you can always count on in higher ed, and that's final exams. We're right here during uh, final examinations week. So all those exams have been transitioned to online for the most part, as far as I know. So... Some challenges there, but you know, hey, you got to make the grade at the end of the day, and and we're we're making our way through, you know. Sure, are you gonna start a side business? You're, I heard, good at giving haircuts. You know, I see what you've done up here. It's pretty good. Oh. Can you come over to my place when it's all done and give me a haircut? Yeah, so it's an interesting story. Um, you know, hopefully uh, I, I don't have any tax implications, but, you know, a uh, long, long time ago when I was in undergrad, one of the things I did as a little side hustle to help get myself through school without any loans was uh, haircuts. Uh, There's a couple catches still, right? It was only $10. Good deal, right? That's not good. good. You know, I like my deals. Absolutely. And you had to want this haircut. Because it was one haircut, and it was this haircut, and that's the only haircut you get. So if you like a fade with the one on the sides, like a four on the top, all day. If you like something else, you get a fade with one on the sides and four on the top. really didn't matter. (laughs) Well, you know I like my early bird specials, Kevin. You know, that's been a big issue right now with the pandemic. I can't get to any restaurants. They're not offering them. What should I do lately? Yeah, I don't know. That's got to be really tough. I know that that's kind of your go-to thing. You got to get those deals. I know. The silver lining to all this, though, is I'm saving a fortune. You know, uh, my children are no longer going to nursery school, right? So I, I save that cost. Uh, Geico made a decision to save me 15% on my auto insurance. So there's some silver linings coming out of this. I know, of course, a lot of businesses are struggling, you know, but at the same time, personally, a lot of people are saving at the end of the day. And I've heard a lot of small businesses, you know, are starting to get their payment protection plan money. So the good news is, you know, if you're getting your money, you know, make sure use it on other small businesses. That's what it's all about. You know, 99% of all businesses across the United States are small. So definitely, you know, support local. So let's jump into our guests on the show today. Yeah, this is a new series, our fireside chats that we're doing on the shrimp tank. We're going to continue this, you know, being that we can't do our in-person typical podcast at our studio, but we have four amazing, amazing guests today. So I'm going to just go in a circle. I want everyone to spend a minute to really give us you know, uh, elevator pitch about yourself as well as the company and what you're up to. So Sandy, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about what's going on in your world right now. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. So I am a high performance productivity coach. I specifically work with women who are stressed out, burn out, feel like they're just on that never ending hamster wheel. And I help them to just maximize their productivity and be fulfilled at the end of the day. You know, we wear a lot of hats as women. I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a business owner, and there's just a lot to do in 24 hours. And I take women from going, feeling overwhelmed and burnt out and stressed and into balance and feeling like they can do it all while being productive and being fulfilled. Sure. Alex, tell us a little bit about what's going on in your world. Sure. So my name is Alex Vidal. I'm the president of a local real estate brokerage called Related ISG International Realty. 
Uh, we are a five office going on six office brokerage with almost 500 realtors. Uh, we're co-owned by the Related Group, the largest high-rise developer in the country, uh, as well as a company called ISG that does development representation. Aside from that, I have a show that, my own show like you guys, like Sandy and like, and like you, um, called The Closer Club, where we just completed episode 104, 104, 104 weeks in a row yesterday. Awesome. So you can find awesome. that at you beat me Club. to episode 100. I can't believe it. <laughs> you know, I, was, I had the lead on you this entire time and you got there before us. Because I didn't stop. Yeah, I know. We transitioned for three, four weeks, you know, trying to figure out if we're going to stick to in-person or finally I took my co-host's <clears> idea and said, let's start doing Zooms. Kevin yeah. was the one who originally said, let's go right into this. And it's my fault. I, I'll take the blame. And uh, <laughs> Alex, we'll definitely get back into your subject a little later, you know, about, you know, how it is to kind of tackle both at the same time. And, and Alex's signature, if anyone's wondering out there what all these autographs are, it's people's motivational quotes after they've done an episode on the shrimp tank. So Todd, Sandy, one day, you know, when we open yeah. up our, our studio, want you guys to come on back and do an in-person podcast, of course, and then put your autograph up on the wall. So John, tell us a little bit about Sama Labs. What's going on over there? Yeah, I'm trying to see if I could find my signature too up there. It's, it's up there. <laughs> it's up there somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm the president of Sama Labs. My name's John Flory. Uh, we are a 32 person uh, creative marketing agency here in Boca, um, handling mostly direct response e-commerce brands across the country. Uh, we have our own brands that have been running for several years now that we are able to, um, you know, leverage our own experiences to help companies navigate finding new customers, keeping their existing customers, um, and especially now using um, digital as a way to communicate with uh, an audience when digital is really the the uh, main driver to reach people. So. Um, yes do everything in house and uh, really proud of, of what we've been able to do uh, transitioning, you know, in this time too. Yeah. I see you're very active on social media. I see you're, you're, you're looking in the future and not just in by doing what you guys always did in the past. Uh, Todd, what's happening. I know you're new to Florida, right? How long have you lived in Florida and you were just transitioning portion of your business down here. How's everything been going? Yeah. Yeah. So new to Florida, two years, right. From uh, the cold North, not not New York though, right? So from uh, from Ohio, out of the Midwest, but um, uh, it's going well. We a good transition. Offices are still located in, uh, in Northwest Ohio, but we have remote offices also across you know several states as well. We're a, a cloud service managed provider. Now I may be going into the haircutting business just for some tips there for you guys. I got some uh, these mutton chops and maybe some uh, uh, a mullet going on here if we don't get a haircut soon. But uh, nonetheless. <laughs> But, uh, there we go. But uh, cloud service management provider, we provide um, uh, cloud-based IT services, uh, physical security as a service, video surveillance as a service, uh, things of that nature, really. So cutting edge, next gen with artificial intelligence and, and analytics. So, you know, it, it can get pretty technical, pretty complicated, but they're, uh, you know, our target audience is obviously that SMB to enterprise space. And, uh, you know, so that's what we're doing. And it's, uh, it's an ever-changing environment and always growing. Sure. I let you. I I like that you're from Ohio because my wife's from Ohio, and that's how we started to get along. Of course, hmm. haven't met a mean person from Ohio yet. So yeah. hopefully, don't ruin that. Don't ruin that, Todd. <laughs> right, right, right. Kevin, what do you think about all these, you know, amazing guests that we have on today? Yeah, a uh, really diverse group again, which is exceptional. It kind of helps us get a handle on the local community and and what's going on in in terms of business and just the the local context. As soon as these other states begin to open, we won't really know anything for a couple of weeks in terms of like what those implications are, whether or not that works, what our future is in South Florida, though maybe we'll experiment a little bit sooner. So I'll jump right in and ask um, Alex, you know, uh, from a real estate perspective, what do, what do you see across the industry in particular, you know, you have the, the commercial side where, where so many people are, are maybe there's been almost a forced experience experiment with um, uh, a lot of the um, young professionals I work with recent graduates where, you know, they'd have always bantied about working from home, but never really been forced into it. And now you see that. Um, what do you see from your perspective of uh, the future commercial or even implications residential real estate wise? Well, residential real estate wise, single family homes continue to do really, really well. And I'll, I'll speak more to that just because that's more my forte than commercial, but I'll, I'll chime in on the commercial side. Um, residential real estate's on fire. Single family homes, 700,000 and below are doing really, really well. Inventory is really low. Mortgage rates are low, which means the buyer, the ability of buyers being able to afford more is big, uh, which is great. 
Um, I think that um, commercial real estate, in particular office space, you're going to see a decline. Like I'm even looking at my own office and saying, do I need all the brick and mortar? Uh, we definitely need brick and mortar, but do we need as much as what we actually have? Um, and so I think you're going to see declines there and it'll be interesting to see what happens. And Sandy and her husband, um, with Grant are involved in, in multifamily. And I think that's going to be, uh, continue to do really, really well. Um, but I'll tell you, residential real estate is going to crush it. Multifamily is going to crush it. Traditional office space leases. I think they're going to, they're going to be in for a long road ahead. And how have you guys adapted to this environment? You know, what are the best agents, you know, that you see out there kind of, you know, just turn curving and, and switching their ideas of how they're marketing. Are they going online? Are they doing FaceTimes with other you know, potential clients, for example? What are they up to? Sure. Well, the, the clients that are doing anything in real estate right now are clients that have, and I'm going to steal this from somebody who's on my show. And I, have, I always give credit where credit is due from a guy named Aaron Novello, who talked about, you know, the clients that are doing anything in real estate right now are clients who have a motivation that's bigger than the fear, right? So putting that aside, you find that motivate, you find that client that has a motivation that's bigger than fear, then from that point, it's a function of what side are you on? If it's most primarily, if you've never met that person, they're using Zoom to do that, that virtual interview. Um, and then before they even get in the car, to, let's say if you're working on the buy side, they're making sure the buyer is either already pre-approved for the loan, they're making sure the buyer, if it's a cash buyer, they have proof of funds, if they're gonna take them out to look at a certain set of properties, because every realtor now is using virtual tours and really high-end photography, they're making sure that the buyers are, have looked at all the photos to you know, whittle that inventory down. And then from there, they're even asking them to drive by the property to make sure they even like the area. So I'm not walking into that home until I know the buyer can buy it. They've driven by it and they've seen the interior photos. And we're asking our listing agents to do the same. The top agents right now are going where the market is hot. Condos suck right now. Uh, a lot of buildings aren't allowing buyers to, to even, and realtors into the building. Uh, some associations are not allowing people to move in and move out. And so if you're strictly a condo buyer or a condo realtor, you're very slow. But I had one agent who only does single family homes. He put a $600,000 house on the market at 6 p.m. yesterday. By 9 p.m. he had one full price offer. By 9 a.m. he had another full price offer on the property. Sure. I don't see. And I got to figure it, there's going to be a trend where the East Coasters are going to shift even quicker. Right. Anyone in New York, Jersey, Massachusetts, you know, the numbers of coronavirus are through the roof and they, they think a second wave could come. Right. So it's a great opportunity for them to come down buy a condo. And before that second wave comes, go go pick something up. I have to believe. And then also interest rates are so low. Right. It's a good time. I mean, when have we ever seen a 30 year fixed mortgage at I had friends getting two point seven five. Of course, demand has picked up because there have been so many people that went out and tried to refinance. But I got to think. Do you think that a wave of East Coasters will, will shift? No, I, I think they shifted. I, you know, listen, realtors love to, uh, you know, I'm very, you know me, uh, I'm, very, <laughs> I'm very upfront, Jason. I think a lot of people are using that as like a way to, you know, stir up market activity and feel positive. No, I don't think it's going to do anything different. I don't think all of a sudden New Yorkers are coming down to buy here. I think <laughs> a New Yorker wanted to buy down here. They're buying because they wanted to, coronavirus or not. There's going to be one or two that may say, oh, I'm tired of this. Um, but the reality is the New Yorker that was coming down is coming down anyways. I don't think this is going to, not to where you're going to see it on the radar. Yeah. My opinion. So, um, I want to, um, really, really great, uh, insights there. Uh, I want to jump to Sandra and I don't know if anybody else is experiencing this, if she can maybe give us some insights in terms of productivity. Um, I've got some colleagues, not at FAU, not at FAU, of course, but <laughs> seemingly this kind of, hey, you work with other professors and other colleagues that I work with, even some entrepreneurs kind of seem to be like, um, you know, it's hard to get motivated, they're constrained, they're working at home, maybe they never have before, and, you know, do you have any insights in terms of remaining productive, even in this entirely new environment where it might be hard to find a rhythm it's totally different than what you're used to doing. And maybe it's hard to get motivated. Yeah. So this is one of my favorite things to talk about because this is, you know, right now it's people that are, the people that are able to take this opportunity and what's going on in the world right now and really rise above the noise, what's going on. They're going to have the most success on whatever the other side of this looks like. Right. So one of the biggest things um, that I work with my clients on that I do in my group coaching is I tell them whatever your schedule was, whatever you were focusing on before all of this happened. 
stick to that same schedule. If you were getting up at 5 a.m. to get your workouts in and then starting your day, you know, in the office around seven o'clock, whatever that looks like, you need to keep that same schedule. A lot of people are falling into the trap of, well, I'm at home, I can, you know, kick back a little bit, relax, I don't need to be as productive, as motivated. And right now, you need to think about how you're going to get ahead because let everyone else focus on, okay, well, I'll just take the easy road out. You focus on getting ahead and how you can be an asset to your company, be an asset to your business. And what can you do now to pivot and just get really creative and find what the missing pieces in the marketplace right now? There's so many gaps that, and because there's so many unknowns, right? Like we just don't know. We're, we're really just taking this day by day, week by week. And the, the, the business owner, the entrepreneur that really takes the time to take advantage and put a game plan in place. Look, I map out my next day the night before. So before I go to bed every single night, I'm mapping out what I'm doing, the three things I'm focusing on the next day and how to be extremely, extremely productive every single day, moving the ball forward. So be proactive. Don't sit back and think this is a time to just, you know, collect a check and let let you know the world or the government handle it the way it's going to handle it be proactive like take an actual step in moving yourself your business your community and family forward and the more that you get involved the more that you take accountability for what you're doing every single day you're going to see the progress it'll be little by little it's not like you're in an office nine to five or whatever hours you work um, but if you can be proactive about it and set those steps into place ahead of time, you're going to be so far ahead of everybody else. I totally agree. On our first episode, we talked a lot about that, where some of the things you're doing in your business, you know, you might not see the results for six months mm -hmm. or a year from today, but people are going to remember. They're going to remember the brands that went out of their way during these difficult times, you know, to be by their side. If it was donating to certain restaurants, if it was, you know, just helping a hand you know, at a restaurant to hand out food or just sending thank you cards and just saying we're on your side during these difficult times. So I, th I totally agree with you, you know, and, and what we're also seeing is business not doing that. You know, I've witnessed big, big corporations really act, you know, on one end saying, hey, we're there for our small business owners. But on the en other end, you know, charging them more in these difficult times. And I've, I've noticed it. I won't call any of them out right now, but I'm about to, you know, because I know what some of them are doing and it's, it's not right, you know, to kind of have your website saying you're transparent and mm -hmm. in support of these businesses and they're not really doing that. Uh, John, tell us, you know, on your end, you know, uh, how you guys have started doing different things. I see a lot of uh, different things on LinkedIn that you've been posting recently and you guys are teaming up with Facebook. I started seeing different things going on there. Tell us more. Yeah. So it's an interesting time because it's, um, you know, uh, us as an agency, we've always been in-house, right? So the transition to full remote during this time has been, um, it was unique to us, but we adapted pretty well because we work in, an, in a category where it's very adaptable to work remote, right? And um, a lot of agencies out there that are 100% remote companies, um, we just had never been for the last two and a half years. Um, so it's, it's uh, unique because agencies across the board, I speak to a lot of agency owners, um, the, the, business is down about 30 to 50% in some cases. We are very fortunate to have a very diverse um, client base that we didn't get hit that bad. I mean, March was pretty bad. April, I think people and, and brands, um, big retail brands, Amazon brands are realizing we need to diversify how we drive revenue into the company. And we, if we rely on one source, God forbid something like this happens again or at a larger scale, we're gonna be um, in, a, in a bad circumstance. So. I think last month and, and even today, um, a lot of companies are realizing that they have to think about digital, even though they thought they thought about it. When you look at Neiman Marcus, for example, filing bankruptcy, they started thinking about e-commerce two years ago and it's already too late, you know, and they didn't really think about it well enough or put that much attention into it because they were ignorant to the possibilities of being that reliant on their brick and mortar. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting time. We're adapting as an agency. Team's doing very well working remotely, but and I have to give them credit where credit's due. And give us some details on Facebook. I know you guys have a big ad budget for a lot of companies. Are, are you seeing ad costs go down a lot? Kind of tell us what's happening in the Facebook world. CPMs are going down, um, but it's not a direct correlation to like uh, driving more revenue necessarily. It, it certainly helps because you can get more eyes. Um, we have gotten some indications that... Um, 
usage is like more than doubled right now overall, which is kind of an implication considering what's going on. So you can certainly reach more people more efficiently, um, reach a new audience, things like that, things you weren't really um, privy to trying before. So you can stretch your dollar a little bit better than what you've been probably used to. And they're giving grants out, correct? I know you know yeah, a lot about that program. So it's a good opportunity to, of course, everyone's applying for all these grants, but why not through Facebook? If you're a small business, I think two, two plus yeah, employees, so you can do it. There, I think the applications ended yesterday or today. They were selecting about 30,000 companies. You had to be within the vicinity of a Facebook office though. So they really narrowed it down um, to, to people that like for us, you'd have to be within a certain zip code range of the Miami office. Um, and they were giving away around four to five thousand dollars to each business. Some in ad credits. Some they would just, you know, cut you a check pretty much. So uh, Google's going to be doing something similar to that too. But I think that will be stripping the form of ad credits. Sure. So I'm curious. You mentioned uh, the diversity of your portfolio, which absolutely has to be a good thing. I am wondering because I mentioned that because there's been all oh, there's been uh, there's been a lot of winners and losers. Really, that's not a good way to put it. There's been some fortunate businesses and some less fortunate businesses, right? Sure. Just due to the dynamics of things, right? If you're selling home fitness equipment online, you sold out. Everyone sold out. It's gone. You're wiped out. If you're selling um, men's hair, dress pants, you probably you know you're probably having a real tough time of it. I know I turned all my dress pants into face shields and face masks. I don't even own any or wear any at all anymore. So are you starting to, is it still like that out there in the digital landscape or are we starting to see some stability in terms of product demand or is it still pretty wild? Um, I mean, consumer behavior is up. Shopify came out sure. and said that, you know, people are still buying stuff. It hasn't slowed down. Um, yes, there is going to be that, certain category of like for example coffee Co we have a coffee brand that's that does phenomenally well um we had actually a case study come out with clavio clavio is an email service provider we're a, a platinum partner with them so they featured us in some of the success we'd had amidst the what, what's going on so um healthcare products yeah fitness stuff supplements um face shields of course do very well um but uh yeah i mean it, i think people are just looking for deals overall they're looking to spend money um, some probably smarter than others, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's no magic answer. It's just, you know, yes, the consumable stuff, the convenient stuff are, are definitely doing well right now. What's the number one company you see doing really well? I mean, you guys have a lot of brands. Is there one specific, you know, one that comes to mind? You're like, you can't even believe it. They're just, you know, quadrupling, you know, their sales, anything like that? Uh, a lot to say, of course. Cat categorically, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's apparel coffee and supplements makes sense because i used to go to starbucks or dunkin donuts daily so did my wife and you know i'm saving probably five six grand a year right there yeah. so i mean of course what you have like what kind of apparel um anything women's apparel boutique apparel um really? yeah outdoor stuff it's just like people want to buy and like they can get deals you know the hundred dollar garment they could have bought you know three four five months ago is now like 45 bucks they're gonna buy it you know um i think um the other thing is um, um, CBD was doing pretty well at a certain point because the wellness stuff, people just want things that could or potentially can help them um, from a wellness perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, 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 a, that's a big part of it. Todd, you know, uh, how's the transition been to Florida? You know, you came from Ohio. You know, I, I believe you do a lot of work, you know, with commercial properties. You know, when you came to my office that day, how's everything going on your end? It's good. It's good. You know, we um, obviously we thrive in this remote workforce, right? I mean, that's our whole model is cloud-based technology. You know, we talk about Zoom, for example, and what this product has done it's, as far as its market cap goes. I mean, doubled, quadrupled, right? Because of this same stuff right here. So really, you know, because we sell really on a national level anyways, moving to this market really just kind of give us the opportunity to dive into just the different verticals. You know, and I know that uh, by default, technical companies in South Florida tend to start here, but don't tend to stay here or they struggle to kind of build here. And so one of the things that we seen was an opportunity to bring an established organization to South Florida and to plan our roots here and, uh, and really kind of grow from within. And, and so it kind of goes back to even what, I know we're talking a little bit ago about real estate. You know, one of the things that we do is that automation stuff, right? We're doing, um, for example, un un unattended showings, right? You can do smart lock technology now where you can, 
uh, schedule a time. It sends a code to the to the person that wants to see it from you know 8 a.m. to 9 9, 9 a.m. and then it lets them in and they can see it. And really, all that type of technology today is really making things more efficient. Uh, it, it's a utility-based service, at least that's what it's becoming. So it's that reoccurring revenue as well. So it's enabled us to really build that that solid base of diversity as well within our space, within our uh, particular verticals that we target. And obviously being multifamily dwelling units in this market down here do well for us, right? So that's a that's an area for security and uh, and, and automation and smart technology as well. So it, it you know, the transition has been pretty good. It's been easy. Obviously the, uh, the weather has been great, right? Uh, so, Tell us so a challenge. You know, I know when I moved three years ago down here and I had to relocate, I took, you know, a big leap of faith, you know, and that's kind of how this shrimp tank was created, actually kind of taking two steps backwards, kind of think about how is it going to market differently in South Florida? You know, what was the, ch what were some of the challenges you kind of have been dealt with? Not the coronavirus, of course, prior to this, you know, sure. that you did within your business. Yeah, you know, it's, it's always difficult when you go to a new market and you don't know anybody, right? It's, uh, you, you really got to make a name for yourself and kind of get out there. And that's been, that's challenging, um, especially with, again, today, we, we've de-socialized as a population from um, really going to meetings and talking to texting and emailing. And so um, moving here, you know, and really kind of getting that, that grip or grasp really on the market segment, what is it doing here versus in other areas of the country? Um, and then really being able to position our product set and our, and our services to really meet the needs and the demands here. It's different in Ohio, right? We're rural. It's a rural area uh, for the most part. So here, you know, you, people are on top of people and, and there's a lot of competition always. And the other thing, people always fight to get to zero, right? Everybody's trying to drive the price down and win by price. So being able to build a product brand and a service that brings value, you can sell at a higher rate, a higher profit margin, um, in, in a more populated space is oftentimes difficult as well without having yeah. a, a known entity here. Kevin, you're always talking about that. You know, Kevin is the director at the Adam Center for Entrepreneurship. So he sees a lot of businesses come into this market and think they can do exactly what you just mentioned. Why don't you touch mm -hmm. on some of this, Kevin, from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I see really kind of both sides of it, really, I guess all sides of it. I see organizations that start here and then um, oftentimes in the technology space, as you mentioned, they look for external funding, which um, while the environment continues to evolve in terms of traditional, you know, startup investing, right, be that angel investors, um, structural angel, angel groups, or uh, even venture capital, uh, it's not as sophisticated or as comprehensive as we see in other areas. Um, there's not necessarily a specific in industry, which can be a good thing, but also uh, sort of a negative thing. It's not necessarily a hub. So in many instances, yeah, we see companies that, that leave um, because they have a hard time finding funding, one, or getting the terms that, that are equivalent to what they might find in a place like, say, Southern California. At the same time, we also see companies very much like Todd's um, come down and succeed because there is a lot of wealth here. There's a lot of market activity. There's um, basically a lot of money, right? In, in South Florida, at least More part of the year. So it's a great environment, particularly for an established company to move into and, and they can really thrive. At the same time, there's some challenges, there's some limitations and and you've really got to learn um, the context, but you know, getting involved with the, the folks on the shrimp tank and all these local entrepreneurs is a, is a great step in that direction. Yes. And I think when we had uh, Just Salad on the show, he really talked a lot about that. You know, Just Salad, I think has 30, 40, you know, franchises in New York City where they own them, they're corporate owned stores. And then when he got down here, he wasn't seeing the set success. He realized that you have to give way more into the community activities. And then once he started giving back, I think he started to see a lot of success. So just out, it was a great episode. I think 90 to 95, somewhere in that range, if anyone wants to go out and listen to it. Uh, Alex, you know, I want to pick on you and Sandy for a moment. You know, both of you juggle multiple hats. You know, uh, you have multiple income streams. So I want to talk about like running the, you know, a, a podcast show, you got over a hundred episodes. And you know, how do you juggle, you know, both being in a corporate structure? Sure. Well, Sandy, why don't you go first? Ladies first and then. I'll yeah. Go. Yeah. Thank you. So like I said, I'm a mom, I'm a wife. I'm, I run multiple um, 
I should say levels to my business. So I have my business where I do my coaching. I have my podcast. I have a community called Project in Charge, which I run with my business partner, Natalia Kern. And there's a lot of hats and you just have to be really, really organized and structured. And at the end of the day, the system that I have for myself, and this is again, what I teach my clients, um, you know, you can't be in a hundred places at once. So you need to pick a lane and you need to do that really well when you're in it. You know, I'm not trying to take on mommy duty while I'm trying to do an interview or be on a phone call or send out emails, you know, so I get to be a hundred percent in the thing that I'm in when I'm doing it. And I make sure that my days are structured based on what I need to get done. So all of us are entrepreneurs. Not every single day is the same. Every day looks completely different. Some days, you know, I'm shooting content. Other days I'm on coaching calls. Other days I'm, I'm creating my programs, but it's, it, you have to know what needs to get done and what's going to move the ball forward. So for me, that's why I say when I plan out my days, I have a structure to my day. I know what I'm doing each day, but I also have my targets that are going to move me intentionally forward each day. So it's not, again, it's not the same thing that I'm doing every single day, but it's something that I know if I need to shoot a podcast episode, I have an interview, I'm launching a book in a month, you know, what are the goals that I have and then the targets, meaning the steps that I'm actually taking to hit those goals. And every single day is planned out and structured. And look, like I said, I'm a mom, things pop up and they happen. So you have to know what to prioritize when. And I think that's the biggest question I get from my clients is they're like, well, what happens when you plan your day and it doesn't go exactly the way that you planned it? And I say, you need to to focus on that actually being the norm. Like most of the time, it's not gonna go exactly to the plan, according to the plan that you had. So that's why we focus on the three things that are gonna move you forward each day and just putting the attention on that. Everything else, if you get it done, it's amazing, but you just need to focus on what's gonna move you forward each day and intentionally going into your day so you can be present in each area. I totally agree. You know, we see so often entrepreneurs, they try to do Facebook ads, YouTube, podcast, and they yeah. go all over the place, but they don't have the marketing budget for all these different activities. And if they just concentrate on one or two of these items and made it their niche, they would come out on top. But too often, everyone wants to do everything today. Yeah. So yeah, Alex- so Stay in your lane, know what you're good at, and go yeah, for that. Absolutely, absolutely. Alex. Yes, sir. Tell us about your podcast, you know, what it felt like to hit episode 100, you know, and uh, how you're transitioning through this. Because I know you were all over the place. You were in California, New York, and you were doing a lot of in-person podcasts yourself. Thanks. And, um, you know, also how it relates back to your industry and kind of a lot of people always wonder, like, does a podcast make sense? You know, is it working besides for a bunch of views? So can you dive in a, a bit deeper than more than just views and tell us, you know, what the podcast has done to your life? Sure. Absolutely. So uh, it's interesting. Yeah. I've gone to, I've gone to LA six times, New York, five times, uh, rally, Dallas, Aspen, Vegas for the show. Um, and in all reality, really what it was, it was very simple. It was, by the way, it's not an additional revenue stream. I don't actually make direct money or nor does the broker to make direct money from the show because of sponsorships. What it's done is it's helped us recruit hundreds of agents to the brokerage as a result. And in turn, they do deals. And that's how we make money. Every time they close a deal, we make money. Um, and it actually got us out of a lawsuit too, which was uh, probably saved us another couple hundred grand in and of itself. Um, so those two huge benefits are there. That's how we've made money off the show. It actually added an entire month's worth of company dollar to our bottom line in 2019, to give you an idea. The, the show's really started simple. For us in the real estate world, you know, there's 65,000 realtors in Dayton, Broward County. And, and there's another, I don't know how many thousands of brokers, right? So if everything was the same, commission splits, managerial support, broker support, uh, marketing, office locations, et cetera, wouldn't you want to work for somebody that not only you like, but also happens to be connected to some of the biggest real estate players locally? And that's how it started. And you know, so you look at it and say, okay, what's the sandbox that they play in? And, and everybody on here is for the most part is strong on social media. And, and so realtors, that's the sandbox they play in. They play in social media. Well, what's the toy that they play with the most in social media? It's video. And that's why I launched the show. And about, I don't know, I'm going to say 30 episodes in, 20 something episodes in, I asked to be a speaker at a big, at a big event. Um, and they rejected me saying that they didn't know who I was or my brokerage. And I hung up the phone and I said, thanks very much. And that's when I went national with the show. Um, and it's been a hell of a ride. And it's definitely from an exposure standpoint, 
gotten our brand out there uh, more so than ever before. I think everybody in the local South Florida marketplace knows related ISG in the realtor space, at least, which is my customers. Um, we recruited, like I said, hundreds of agents, some really amazing, solid players. Um, and we've been able to leverage those connections. So for us, the show has been, been huge. Um, it sucks because uh, like you guys, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm, I'm much better in person. Um, I'd rather fly to California for a day, not even a day. I would land. So let's say I interview Tom Bilyeu, the founder of Quest Nutrition, net worth $500 million. Literally fly in, land, drive to his house, interview him in his living room, drive right back to the airport, fly right back. But I got a cell phone number. He knows who I am. I can text him. We can talk. You know, I had those kind of connections, whereas I just interviewed Chris Vaz, the, um, the author of Never Split the Difference, which is an amazing book. Um, I hope he remembers me, but we did it via Zoom. And if he had 10 Zoom interviews that day, he may or may not remember me. Whereas if I interviewed him in person, you know, that that face-to-face, that -face, belly-to-belly, palm-to-palm connection, I think is, is unlike anything else. So cool to get to episode 100, but, um, and I had an amazing guest in Tom Ferry, the, the top real estate coach and trainer in, in the country, um, real estate sales agent, coach and trainer in the country. But it wasn't my ideal episode 100. It was going to be like my dad and the five biggest influences on my life. And, uh, and so and they were flying in to do the interview just for episode 100. And we're going to have dinner afterwards and all that. Um, but we're still going to do it. It'll just be, I guess, in a, in a couple It'll of months. It'll be episode 200. You just got to get to 200 quicker. Yeah, no yeah. shit. <laughs> so, uh, and if there's any, uh, any students or any entrepreneurs out there, I'd encourage them to take a listen to that episode with Chris Voss and maybe even grab his book, Never Split the Difference. Absolutely. That's one that I strongly endorse in terms of figuring out how to do negotiations. He literally was dealing with people's lives hanging in the balance, but those same lessons can be applied to business. Great book. I'm sure it's a great interview with Alex. Yes, it was one of my favorites for sure. Yeah. And we, and we would agree with you. There's a huge difference when you meet someone in person and you're asking them, you know, different questions about their business and their life and you're staring them right in the eyes versus a Zoom call where sometimes you're looking into the video camera, you know, at the top of a computer and then, you know, really getting a sense of their nervousness with a, you know, we put a light on them. Of course, it gets more nervous in our studio and there's a student in our studio. There's a student sitting in the background. Usually there's a producer of the show sitting in there. So there's always a good vibe you know, on the in-person and less people are doing in-person. So bottom line is, when you look at the total numbers, you know, Zoom is so easy. You could buy this microphone right here for about 100 to $150. It's top of the line, plug it in, and you have a podcast over Zoom and Facebook. But you can't, you know, take that experience away of flying to California. And they're not going to no-show you. You just flew to California to go do right. a show with them. And then it helps you get other shows. You're like, hey, I'm flying all the way to California for X, Y, or Z you know, I, I'm also going to try to get some other person on my show while I'm out there. Why not? And I know you have done that in the past, you know, uh, yeah, on your way out. It, you know, I think it'll be interesting though to see if that remains the case, right? So I work with students all the time and, and we've got to keep in mind, we're all, we're all getting a little bit older. Um, this generation coming up has generally been more comfortable with the, with the online communication tools, you know, for better or worse. And I, I, I'm with you, Jason and Alex, certainly, that there's something to, to in person that you can't get any other way. But one, you know, they were already used to that. Now they're going to be forced into it for, who knows, 12 months, 18 months of only doing it. They may be better at that than they are in person. I, I see it all the time. You know, I try to get done. Um, that, that's a shame. I mean, everybody in here, they're, they're killer, killer salespeople. That would be, that would be an absolute shame. Um, I, 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 I think I, I think of like, you know, I, I think of Sandy and I've seen Sandy in her coaching, right? And I see her, let's say do a podcast or then maybe she's doing a podcast with, mm -hmm. with Bethany, who's one of my agents, right? And then you see the interaction of them two together. That energy, yeah. that in-person energy, it cannot be replaced. And I, and I will tell you, the reason I have gotten the guests that I've gotten, and I've had like $11 billion worth of net worth on my show, has been because I'm the one guy saying, they're like, okay, so when do you want to do the Zoom interview? This is pre-corona. I'm like, no, 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 I'm flying in. Yeah, but you're in Miami. I'm like, uh-huh, and? and? And then I actually got the interview because I was showing them that I was committed to the show and making the effort to go out there versus being, I don't want to say lazy, it's not the right word. It just, that I, was, I wasn't just taking it like as something I can do that's only going to take Taking the initiative. Yeah, I was committed to it. Like, I'm, yeah. hey, I'm putting the money behind it, let's do it. 
And, and, and then I'll tell you, forget the on camera shit, you know, like the camera stuff is great. Um, and when I had both Jared on and, and Grant and Elena and all that, like the conversations off camera. Yeah. I, I wish I could record those because that's where the fun is. That's actually that's a lot where the relationships are built. You know, you you have the you have the the actual interview that you do, but then there's the pre and the post that you can really build the dynamic in the relationship, you know, and who knows what comes after that. That's where like all the juice is. And and for me, I actually went to school for broadcast journalism and I love everything media. So TV and radio and, and, and all of that. But it's true, like the real relationships will come out of being in person. It's just, it's just a different dynamic that you can't get when you're talking to a screen, even though there's someone on the other line, you know, on the other side, it's just so much deeper when it's, you know, person to person. I think Kevin just doesn't like sitting next to me. He thinks I smell or something. Not it, Kevin? <laughs> yeah, it's hot. You don't want to be in our little, our little studio when the air conditioner goes off. Gets hot in our studio because we turn the AC off and the sunbeams. The wind is this no, what it is, Kevin? Very hot. So, no, I didn't bring it to you guys. I, I, I just, I, I, I just think it'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, what what we see kind of in the in the next generation if they kind of break out of their shell um, and are, you know, um, I teach entrepreneurship, obviously. So the most important thing you can do is talk to customers, talk mm -hmm. to your customers in person, and man. They, they want to text, they want to survey monkey, they yeah. want to Google well, form, they want to do, yeah. and you just, you, I agree, like you miss so much information, but that's what they perceive themselves as being better at, that's what they're more comfortable doing, and now they're kind of being allowed to do it, if not forced to do it for a significant period of time, so I, I just think well, the, I'm gonna pick the on social you, influences will bring let, what let them you with all the school, all the students. <laughs> How do you feel if the student said, I never want to come back to FAU and I want to do all 100% online? Well, that could do oh. to the, the system. Oh, it would be, uh, it'd be terrible. I mean, yeah. we, can, we can make it work and we already have online classes. We have distance learning. We have all those kind of things. But like I said, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I just interact with them more often. And, you know, they live on Instagram. They live on Snapchat. They don't necessarily live amongst the people they live amongst their online peers. So many of them. So it's, it's just, I, I bring it up because it's an interesting time, but no, no, I mean, you miss something being in, in the person in synergy and making connections and, and all the things you guys really already mentioned and hit on, not to mention you can't perceive tone or inflection or any of these things from a text. So you really have no idea what the person's saying. Like, yeah, that product's great. <laughs> right or like hey that product's great that, that that's the same words but um they have very different and you could do one of these when you're in a studio for cinco de mayo can't do it over <laughs> zoom. you can't do, i can't share this with alex over zoom or todd or john or sandy i'm <laughs> pregnant so you know you can you can drink mine for me <laughs> I, got, I got i got my bar all right oh there. we could cheer uh, at, the, at the end of the episode alex we might have to do one i'm gonna change gears John, how much of your business is in person, like prior to coronavirus, how much of your, your, the pitch to get clients to sign, to, for, you, for clients to hire you? What, what percent were in person via phone call and all that? Really good question. So um, traditionally, low, like our, our client base is across the country and even internationally. So um, a good amount of the local clients got to see the entire uh, infrastructure of our company, which is four different e-commerce companies plus the agency. So they got to see everything working in real time. Um, and they got also get to see what it's like to build a brand, um, develop a brand and go through those milestones. Um, now everything is just like this, a Zoom call. So it, the dynamics changed a little bit, but people are used to it. You know, they're expecting it almost. Um, and uh, it really hasn't put a damper on us. I, you know, right now, um, literally today, three clients that onboarded with us are New York, Texas, and uh, Jacksonville. So, um, you know, they, they get to know us a little bit, you know, obviously there's the, the sales cycle that like any business has. Um, we've made some modifications to it to, uh, to, to, to get to know them better, uh, you know, beforehand. Um, a lot of what we do is value backed and, and that's, we're, 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 we pride ourselves in the transparency of it all. Right. So that's, um, that's a big factor of it. So, um, it's not any different than what it used to be. It's just the, the experience is a little bit different.
Well, you're I, sorry, man. I'm, Jason, I'm asking all these questions. I apologize. I can't. I, can't I love help. it. I'm taking a break for a change. <laughs> was your close rate higher with your local clients? I got to see your operation versus the ones over the. Oh. Yeah, I mean that's just the byproduct. It's natural at that point. You know, um, it's, it helped. So it, it's still there. You know, it's not, nothing's changed on that side. And and um, now we get to really add a new layer of a company that's achieved scale and dealing with this new normal and how we're dealing with it ourselves, um, which also still gets translated to some of the existing clients that we have that are, you know, um, dealing with some similar problems with fulfillment. And ironically enough with Jen uh, from Shipmunk being on uh, last week, he's a great partner of ours. We've known him for a long, long time. And, and, you know, he's been a very good resource for us to have for e-com companies that have trouble with fulfillment. So um, having that network is also just as important. Yeah. And for anyone out there, you got to take a look at SAMA Labs You go online. But I've done the tour of SAMA and I think you guys moved, but recently it was right next to SA company. And it's awesome to just go in there and, and see both at once. And you see hundreds of workers, you know, a lot of them are FAU alumni, went to college around here and just this young, you know, vibrant, you know, attitude, you know, and Sam has got their big painting up on the wall. So I think a lot of that has to do with it, of course, right? When you, every agency is not the same, you know, you could look the same on a website, but when you walk into that office and you're just like, wow, this, you know, and I didn't do it. You guys came to our shrimp tank show first. I'm like, yeah. I was naive. I'm like, who are these guys? Cause we booked last minute. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I don't even know who they are. And then afterwards, you know, I started figuring out, I'm like, wow, you know, totally. Well, I mean, look, they visited. Yeah, I mean, there's our world is very competitive, as a lot of you, I'm sure, know. And um, we have a, a unique advantage that we have a brand and we also have a production studio and all the, the, the right tools, but we just, uh, the blueprint is, um, you know, proven for us. But I want to touch on something really quick that, you know, going back to the podcasting thing, that's really part of what I'm, um, I'm educating a lot of business owners for because not enough people are focusing on branding. They're going right to the bottom, buy my product, buy my service, here's, here's who I am. And they're not doing enough value-backed education. I think podcast is a great way to, to do that, you know, peripherally, where you're not really asking for anything. You're uh, providing education, um, um, giving a lot of value. And then the byproduct of that is what Alex was talking about with the growth they had last year. So I think that's something to really, really focus on, especially now you can really, you know, if you're the landscaper of the bad yard, now you can clean up your own yeah. stuff and, and uh, really you know, focus on that too. Yeah. But it's a, it's a commitment, right? So, and, and I know Sandy can t attest to this and so can Jason. You, it's not something like you're going to see a lot of people that got into podcasting now during the, the quarantine. I guarantee you as soon as we get back into our office, it's going to be gone because they're not committed to it. And if, you, if you're not committed to it, you're going to, you're going to get your ass kicked one day and then you're going to just not, not want to do it anymore. You're going to get a cancellation last minute or you're going to get a rejection or whatever. God knows we get a lot more rejection before we get people saying, yeah, I want to come on some realtor in Miami show, you know? Of course. Okay, Todd, we have a couple of questions from our audience. So I'm just going to jump in as we wrap the show up, ask some of the audience, and then we're going to ask each other some questions. Jason, I want to ask Todd a question. Can I? Sure, can go I, ahead. Todd, talk to me about that, that the, the people being able to get access to a property via their phone and all that stuff. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, so it's, it's switched really to automation. You know, we talk about really what, what smart technology and really the smart automation is inside these MDUs, builder programs, realtors, and so on and so forth. And it, it starts off really on two different levels. It's an automation pack, really that's designed for uh, thermostat, water sensors, uh, heat detection, carbon dioxide. And it's really designed in that, that deal of saying, hey, here you go, to where the property management and HOA can manage the property or the owners can manage their properties or rental properties at any time at any moment and keep track of all the utilities. I mean, as you know, right, one of the biggest concerns in this industry is floods, fires, things of that nature, or it floods and you don't know that it floods or something happens. Yeah. The automation starts there. And then it goes to a security piece where you, you come into a, uh, the ability for, um, to be able to schedule, um, unattended showings. So really it, it's got a mobile app technology. You've got a dashboard or what we call a single pane of glass where you can go in and you can, you can control everything you want. So if you want to add somebody that wants to go see this particular house at this particular time, you can schedule that individual. It will send them a text notification with a unique link to a code, or you can unlock it or auto automatically unlock when they're there with proximity and some geofencing. So there's a lot of technology around that now where a lot of these realtors are finding that, hey, look, COVID-19, the, the property's vacant. 
or I've got tenants that want to see that property after traditional business hours. And I don't want to have a maintenance person there or property management there. Look, just go look at the property. We've already got all of your information. You send us your license. Here's the code. And it tells them when they get there, it notifies them and notifies them when they leave. And then the automation says, Hey, they left the lights on the thermostat was at 87 or at 64 and it will auto readjust everything back to the way that it needed to be. And wow. so it Very creates cool. that seamless connection and, and ability uh, for a lot of these technologies with homeowners. And one last thing with that, we're finding that when, when the homes come with a smart automation technology, the, it takes the home valuation up by about up to 20%. So homes that want to sell that don't have some sort of smart technology today, realtors can promote it and say, look, if you add a smart component, we can increase the value of your property up to 20% because now you've got smart technology that these new buyers are looking to get into. And so when we start looking at that, and you come to all those technologies in, it's a seller's, it's a seller's um, opportunity to really generate additional revenue. And it's a buyer's way to create additional equity in their property upon purchasing. So a lot of different things there within that space that uh, we're starting to see come to fruition um, with, with the Z-Wave and the automation and the cloud stuff. You know, that actually makes a lot of sense in terms of the, the, the value that you can add because as much as I love technology and doing cool things and controlling everything just from my palm and my phone, what do I hate setting it up? Man, do I hate when it breaks and I break it all the time. So it's like, if you can tell me like, hey, that's already done here. You just walk in, turn it on, here's your password. Good, I like the sound of that. It beats the hell out of trying to figure it out sometimes. Well, they've got it with, with maintenance stuff now too. Like if you can set it up to where if you've got a maintenance man on, a, on an HOA or property management deal and your, I don't know, your, therm, your, your furnace stops working or your AC you know, stops working, it'll automatically trigger them, notify them and auto schedule maintenance repairs without you even knowing. And then if it's a MDU, it will actually grant them access during a specific time and the renter or tenant or condo owner doesn't even have to be there. They already know because it's already all pre-scheduled. It's all done automated. Wow. Alex, I'll let you rent my studio if you're in Boca Raton or Sandy. And I'll just let you open up the front doors in the studio for exactly <laughs> an hour and a half. There we go. <laughs> We're in business. So we do have a couple questions from the Facebook Live audience. So we got Travis Neal. He's asking, what permanent changes do you anticipate in your industries on the back end of this pandemic? So probably good question for let's say John, you know, you're, you know, everything's been online already in your industry, but what do you see transitioning that will completely change, I guess, in your field moving forward? So there's us internally as a, as a company. Um, you know, we've had some talks about how efficient the team's been remotely, which at first we were like, holy crap, we got to go remote. This is totally unique to us and we're in big trouble. But within like two, three days, it was like business as usual. Slack makes it super easy. Google Hangout, Zoom, of course, all the tools that we're using. Um, so, you know, us as a company, we may not need a, this huge elaborate office, you know, and obviously yeah. you know, what, how, what happens next and how quickly it happens. Um, on the other side of it, we're, you know, getting more inquiries from, um, like I said earlier, Amazon companies and some bigger box chain retailers that are like, we need to figure this out and fast because, you know, we don't want to be, like I said before, an even Marcus or whatever the case is. So um, I think the, the brands you're used to seeing having these elaborate retail operations or storefronts are probably not going to do it as, sure. as much of a scale. Um, and they're going to go all online. And I think that companies like, like a shit monk fulfillment companies, SAS companies are going to start thriving even more than they have been. SMS is, is, um, yeah. is on a huge rise right now too. Yeah, of course, everyone dealing with Amazon directly as, as their one source, Jan touched on this, they're having major issues because of the delays, right? You could order this microphone right here, say three weeks. And yeah, they're you, prioritizing. And you're going to have an issue. You know, if you're not under their prioritized category, yeah. you know, you're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we got one more question we'll ask uh, from our Facebook Live audience from Eddie Luigi. He says, every said everyone startup let's see hey everyone so startups are also worrying about rising economic uncertainty that's coming with the pandemic the united nations has warned that the outbreak could cost the global economy one trillion dollars this year alone as successful entrepreneurs what would your advice be 
to a young entrepreneur pursuing, pursuing their own business during these typical times. So mm -hmm. what would you guys say? One person jump in and kind of say, if you're, like, obviously he wants to become a, a business owner and it's so hard right now to do. So who, who so wants to I, I, I'll jump in first. Um, there's a ton of uncertainty. You know, we, we have two types of kind of risk in one category and then uncertainty in another. And, and entrepreneurship is characterized by that always. And, and right now we're particularly really, really, really high on the uncertainty um, kind of thing. So, and that's something that's unpredictable and it's hard to deal with, but what we see from entrepreneurs on the show and, and most all of our past guests and the people with us here today is those that succeed, um, although sometimes they may chalk it up to luck, they're the ones that are doers, they're the ones that are fighters, they're the ones that are ambitious. So I'd say, you know, don't be frozen by the uncertainty and the economic context and all these kinds of things, but go and push and, and keep moving, uh, adapt, evolve, you know, yeah. don't just sit around, watch the news and, and be horrified and, and kind of frozen, like I say. Instead, you know, um, adapt, evolve, pay attention to the environment, try to predict things as, as you can. But again, there's a lot of uncertainty. We all know that. And, and you know, just push forward as, as much as you can. Sure. Sandy, I love that. I'm doing, a, I'm doing a training on this actually on Friday uh, for one of my group coaching programs. And I think that this is twofold. I think the first thing is your mindset. You've got to have the right mindset. You know, what you're consuming right now, what you're allowing in your space, what the people around you, you know, are saying, how you show up, like your energy is going to really just, you're going to, especially as a mom, as a leader in the industry, you want to show up as a leader. The leaders are going to rise right now. So you have to be the one that's, that's willing to, to get at the forefront of all of this and really say, okay, we're going this way. This is where I take a stand and, and, and we're going, we're moving forward, you know, so make sure that the value that you're delivering you're just so far above and beyond whatever your competition looks like or whatever businesses you're around, make sure that your, your product and your services, you know, are really, what can you add right now? Look at the process that you have. Maybe there's uh, an, an A to B process, but you're missing something in between, right? So to make sure the value that you have, you're delivering on the value. Oh, look at that cutie. <laughs> and then, um, you know, just, making sure that you have that communication with your customers and what you can provide and, and the benefits of whatever the product or service is to fill that void. Because I think it's so important right now to really, again, rise to the top and find those gaps that you can fill in and just take that value a step above and beyond. Yeah. And uh, Kevin holding a baby reminds us that people do business with people you trust, like, and know. And Alex <laughs> earlier was showing his kids in the pool Sandy, you're posting your children all the time, say with you, Todd. So I think it comes back to a lot of people think that they, you know, have to keep it all business all the time and really, you know, be a human. You know, we all make mistakes. We all cut our hair like this once in a while, right? And, and be a human and people would rather work with those types we find. And I think that is why Alex is very successful in his field is I just notice he's always who he is, you know? You know, even when I meet him in person, he's not trying to be fake to me when I meet him at his office or at my podcast studio, you know, or, you know, other situations. So to tie up this episode. You know, you know, what's, you know what's crazy to top on that? Sorry to interrupt. If on my Instagram. I'm going to start calling you Gary V, by the way. Hey, right. Interrupt that. <laughs> hey, Wiss. Uh, actually, no, I don't wish. I'm happy with who I am. Um, the, if you look at my, so, my social media is a mixed bag of everything. It'll be running my company. It'll be the show. It'll be me exercising. It'll be me with my wife, my family, whatever. The most, and I don't do anything from a boosting perspective on, on Instagram. That's just whatever happens, happens. The most viewed video I've ever had, I could post, name the biggest person and celebrity in the world, I interview him, I'll post a clip, it gets whatever, okay? I post a video of my wife and I doing some like TikTok challenge, like, like balancing, <laughs> right? Like blew up and got more views than anything I've ever done. It was crazy. People care more about that than they care about, uh, you know, a great piece of content. It's funny. Yes, absolutely. So to wrap up this yeah. episode, I want to turn it over to you guys. I want each person to ask another guest a question. So... You know, we'll start with you, Todd. You have a guest, you have a question for one of the guests today. Of course you did. <laughs> no, so I, I do, I do for Alex. Uh, you know, in this market, in this, in, you know, we're talking about even what Kevin just said, uncertain times, right? What, from was, what I think Eddie had requested or just said, you know, hey, he wants to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, being in the real estate space, obviously going through that myself and, and, and purchasing a home and, and trying to refinance. I know that with like these, 
these new changes to the LTVs and these caps that are happening with the banks and yeah. so on and so forth. How is that? I mean, you know, you think about, you know, buyers, people that are just going to, like you said, I think you made a statement. Um, uh, motivation I wrote it down. Yeah, exactly. Motivation for fear. Exactly. I mean, how is that affecting that? And then how is the roadblocks coming up against that in, in the financing space of it, you know, causing a rift in your space or is it? it is. It's causing a rift. I mean, we, um, you know, you have people with the LTVs have absolutely changed, right? So even investment properties, there were some buyers that were getting 15% LTV and then all of a sudden all the people that were doing LTVs, 15% on their investment property disappeared. Now we're back to 25. All the hard money dried up for the most part. So definitely it's funny. There's all this talk of people refinancing and it hits so hard so fast that the banks clamped down. And even though interest rates are quote unquote low, banks aren't necessarily offering those low interest rates out there. Um, and so, yeah, the financing has posed a challenge and, this, and the banks are getting stricter on appraisals and all that. Um, but it's, uh, but again, the, the good thing is if you're a seller, the big and you have low inventory, the pool of buyers out there is bigger. So you're going to find that one buyer that can actually close on the deal. Sure. Alex, you have a question for one of the guests? Or did you Let's use yours it. all up? Hold on. I already, yeah, I already asked enough. I'm good. Okay, John, we'll pick on you. Um, I have a question for Sandy, actually, um, with your coaching stuff. I mean, how has it changed with people having a little bit more free time? Have you noticed uh, an increased demand in people wanting your help to help them like through this and stay positive, especially, you know, moms and, and just families and so like, has that, has that been something you've noticed? Yeah. You know, I had the biggest month of my business last month uh, in April. And I think that people are realizing right now, a, I got to step up my productivity because again, a lot of the, the clients that I work with, they are moms and they're also working full time. So they're like, how do I juggle? How do I figure out how to do all of this and productively, right? I mean, I hear my little guy right outside here, but, um, you know, just really being able to take the, the problem that they have. And I'm constantly doing market research. I'm constantly finding out what do they need the most support around? What do they need the most help on? That's one of the things I coach on as well is don't just assume that you know what your client needs, like actually go out and do the market research and find out how you can help them. So I've been doing a lot of market research and been able to speak to that woman, to speak to that client and say, look, I know what we're going through. I know that this is a difficult time right now. It's changing. We're pivoting and just being able to fill that void. And like I said, last month was the biggest month in my business because I really just was all in on the marketplace and trying to figure out how I could serve and just be a, you know, a tool and a resource uh, to these entrepreneurs and specifically these women who are just like, what do I do right now? So, so yeah, for me, business has, has really skyrocketed. It's been amazing. And um, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to just really dig in deeper. And like I said, the leaders are going to, are going to take their position right now and they're going to rise above and they're going to find out how they can be more resourceful and tap into this and, and be of service. I think that's the biggest thing in any, in any industry is if you can be of service and figure out how you can best help and, and solve a problem, you'll win every time. Cool. Nice. The last question for the day goes to you, Sandy. You got to ask one of the other guests. What's yeah, on your mind? So, so I have a lot of clients who are actually realtors. So the, Alex, this is for you. What can they do because I, again, I get a lot of feedback right now. Oh, you know, it's slow right now because of the marketplace and this and that. And I have my own answer to that. But what would you say for for those realtors uh, in this space? What can they do right now to really get ahead at this time and and to move forward versus looking at this as a you know a time to sit back and step back? How can they really move forward right now? Yeah, two things. Uh, great question because we talk about this with our agents all the time. Um, no, and I'll keep it simple because we've been going for a while. The number one thing is call your sphere of influence. Call everybody you know. You do not need to have a business discussion with them. All you need to do, and I see you kill three things by doing this. All you need to do is ask them how they're doing. Hey, Sandy, it's Alex. How are you? Because what happens is if by doing that, I'm accomplishing the first thing, which is I'm creating that empathetic connection with you, which is like, oh, shit, Alex actually really cares about me, right? But the, the power in that is your answer is going to, it's going to go to number two, which is you're going to tell me whether or not I need to engage you on a professional level. Because if you tell me, hey, oh my God, Jared and I, could you believe it? We just found out I'm pregnant. Now we got to go to a bigger house or, or, oh shit, Jared and I are having a really rough time. I don't know if I can continue in this marriage or, 
or whatever, you know, you have like all these different things there that, or he lost his job, he lost your, whatever their answer is going to tell you whether or not you need to do to engage on a business level. So that's part two. What well, we've been telling our agents is get your exercise in. Um, and if you're not a typical exerciser, I know you work out all the time. I work out all the time. If it's not something you do make your phone calls while you're walking. Um, I literally walked seven miles one day making phone calls and I got my, even though I exercised that day, I did that anyways. And I was able to knock out three birds with one stone. So that's one. And two, to go back to what Todd said, Todd was talking about the financing, understand that the financing landscape is, is changing every single day. So spend every morning doing your market research as to what's happening in the marketplace and what's, and speak to your mortgage broker preferred and find out what's happening. Nice, Kevin. Find out what's happening from a, from a mortgage perspective. Because as Jason said, people do business with you because they like you and they trust you. They like you because, hey, you're personable, you're nice, you know, you, you can, you're, you're a nice guy, you're, I can talk to you, but they trust you because you know what you're actually talking about. Mm -hmm. You do those two things, you'll be good as well. Yes. And something you left out, I remember <clears throat> on the podcast, is those little thank you cards, handwritten, even the, the, the realtors that work with you, you still write their checks and sign them, hand it to them. I and I do think that those little differences mean the world to a lot of people because we've lost touch with the good old, you know, card from Hallmark. And uh, that's something I really learned from my own wife. She loves Hallmark and she still sends cards out every single week. And I do that with our clients, a client focus advisors all the time. So I definitely think those little touches sometimes not everyone sees from the business owners out there, but they're doing it. And that's why it puts them in another field, you know, compared to other business owners out there. Well, Todd, Alex, Sandy, you know, John, thank you for coming out thank to the guys. fourth yeah. fireside chat. Um, for everybody listening, uh, all these podcasts are up on iTunes, iHeartRadio, up on our website, the Boca Raton Shrimp Tank Podcast.com. Every single Tuesday, we're going to do these live, you know, Zoom fire chats. So definitely go on there, ask different questions. Being that it's Cinco de Mayo. Oh, else is going to take waiting. a shot. I got it right here. So, salut. Cheers, Alex, to hitting 100th episode. Thank you know, you. we never got to take a shot together, so we'll do it over Zoom. And uh, thank you again for, for coming on out. And remember to support your small businesses right now. They need it more than anything. You don't have to buy everything off Amazon all the time. Go out and support the local businesses. <coughs> Take care, everybody. Yep. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in a shrimp tank.